Professor Anil Seth, Professor of Cognitive and Computational Neuroscience at the University of Sussex, and David Lingelbach, founder of the Centre for the Study of Oligarchs. Gentlemen, thank you for making time for this conversation. I hope you don't mind if we start with the, with the scientist, um, Anil, and just if you could just uh, broadly tell us your overarching concerns about this, if you have any. Well, anything that's invasive, which is to say, you know, you stick this technology inside your head, I mean, that carries a lot of concerns about the safety. You know, is it going to cause damage? Is it going to cause problems down the line? That's one kind of concern. The other kind of concern is the more ethical concern. What happens with the data uh, that are recorded from the brain that can be transmitted um, to computers on the outside? Uh, there's you know, the possibility that we'll lose control of one of these last bastions of privacy inside our head. But this isn't a new technology, by the way. I think it's important just to say that brain implantation has been going on for at least 30 years um, with results kind of much more um, profound than what Elon Musk has announced today. Interesting. Uh, and I think that is worth highlighting. But you can understand, of course, why he's leapt on this and announced it, because it's it's just grabbed headlines. We're talking about it at the top of the show tonight. In terms of the benefits that this kind of science can bring then, Anil, what are they? On the one hand, there are really important potential benefits in medicine. And this is why I think Neuralink is right to focus on medical applications first. So Musk in the announcement talks about uh, paralysis and if we can have technologies that allow people who are paralyzed to regain control of their limbs by thinking about what they want to do so their limbs can then be controlled uh, by their minds, even though the, the direct connection is no longer working. Well, that's that's amazing. That's that's a real plus. Again, other companies already doing this. A, a company in Switzerland last year helped a paralyzed man to walk through a similar technology. You could extend it even to restore sight or restore hearing in people who've gone blind or deaf by stimulating the brain, perhaps taking input from a camera. So there are many medical benefits where I think it's the ethics of, of safety and so on are outweighed by what it might bring to conditions that are otherwise very, very hard to treat. Really useful context. Thanks for setting that up. Let's head over to the West Coast and speak to Danny Fortson of the Sunday Times. You cover Musk a lot, Danny. And when you're hearing Professor Anult there speaking about the concerns, but also the benefits, but also that other companies have been doing this for some time, a, 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 any surprise to you that Musk is kind of making a big deal out of this? Uh, no, not at all. So I've, I've spoken to several of those companies who are also developing uh, these brain implants. There's at least half a dozen what various stages of development, but they all say, you know, Elon Musk, it's, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. He's brought a great amount of attention to what is, um, as the professor says, very important and life-changing technology for people who are paralyzed. But at the same time, uh, when we're talking about, you know, the future of humanity relative to artificial intelligence, and we're all going to be going his prediction was that, you know, this will ultimately be like LASIK eye surgery where you just go into the mall, you know, have a hole drilled into your into your skull, pop a little chip in, and then we walk out and we're all superhuman. I think th they all kind of rolled their eyes at that, and so they wish that it would be a little bit more grounded in reality. But they do say absolutely, he has brought a lot more attention to this to this kind of growing area, and the, they say that's generally a good thing. Let's cross over to David uh, Lingelbach of the Centre for the Study of Oligarchs. David, we've spoken, you and I, uh, last time you were here in London about Musk and his overarching kind of encompassing view of various sectors uh, spanning geopolitics, telecoms, satellites, everything else like that. With this brain ship technology, do you think he's going to be truly unstoppable? Well, I think, Rosanna, that he's in the process of moving from one type of an oligarch to another. And we're all kind of watching this in real time unfolding. You know, when we talked in November, I think that uh, we could think of him as being uh, an agenda setting oligarch, somebody who, uh, through the control of X, has been a really able to shape uh, the global political conversation. Now, with this technology, he's, he's moving into what I would consider to be the highest form of power of all, which is to say that he can shape how we all think and act. And, and we, of course, have seen this power before uh, in, in uh, some of the other technology companies, but now Musk has put himself squarely in that, making him, I think, really one of the most consequential oligarchs we have today. 
Anil, when you're listening to that and you're thinking about the ethics of the scientists have to walk the line of ethics every day, especially when we talk more about artificial intelligence these days, and certainly with this idea of chips and brains. But there's a few different ethical concerns here, the kind of the power uh, that, that can be wielded, but also in, in the testing phase, some of the stuff to do with animal testing. Uh, what do you know of that? And, and how worried uh, are people about it? Well, fortunately, this kind of research is is quite tightly regulated, and that's for very good reason. I mean, ultimately, if this technology is going to be used in humans, we do need to know that it's as safe as possible. So most new medical technologies do go through stages of work with, with animals. Um, obviously, they're doing their best trying to walk the line between making sure the technology works and avoiding unnecessary suffering to the animals that are part of the research. And Neuralink did get into some hot water a while ago, apparently for cutting some corners on how they were using monkeys as some of their test subjects for early versions of this technology. But it's important to say that for this latest project, they did get approval from the US Food and Drug Administration last year, and, and there's no evidence of any, of any misconduct. But the whole kind of Musk ethos of build things and, and break them and just do everything really quickly, that is for me a little bit worrying when we're talking about something that intervenes in, in the human brain. And we don't, we really don't want the equivalent of the kind of rapid unscheduled disassembly that, that he, he said <laughs> happened when one of his rockets exploded. I don't want that happening inside my head. Thank you very much. Yeah, a rapid unscheduled disassembly of a chip in your brain is not what anyone wants. Danny, uh, I mean, I think that's a very, very salient point. A lot of this is to do with trust of Musk, and there has been a bit of waning trust. Not necessarily, he's still got absolutely ardent fans. I don't want to sound like I'm completely biased against him, purely because I'm a journalist and he seems to uh, have an onslaught against journalists. But uh, he does have a large fan base. Do you think people will be queuing up to try this out? Absolutely not, <laughs> because um, this is for years. This will be focused uh, on people who need it the most, and for whom the benefit is actually a life-changing, you know, improvement. People who are quadriplegic. I've actually spoken to three people who have these type of brain implants, not from Neuralink, Neuralink, but from another company, and they said, "Look, this just actually makes me feel human. I can send an email with my thoughts. I can create art with my thoughts." Otherwise, I'm just stuck in this chair and everybody's having to wait on me. So it, it is a big life changer for those type of people. But at the end of the day, you're talking about elective brain surgery. That is not something you're going to do lightly. And I just don't think that we're very, very far from kind of this being a mass market phenomenon. Let's think a little bit more then about the mass marketness of this and who it's going to be uh, marketed to, especially Musk's uh, version of it. David, when, you, when you're thinking about the way that this could perhaps increase inequality in society? Do you think more after, you know, the medical needs are cared for, the people who are paraplegic, etc., when it becomes commercially available and when people choose to have this, do you think you're going to see much more of the kind of the rich of society getting involved with this? Um, I would think on balance probably that's true, Rosanna. I think we need to have a conversation, which we're just starting to have as a global society, about how we effectively regulate oligarchs like Musk. And I, I don't think we have really got a good handle on this. We're, we're experimenting a lot uh, across the world in using a variety of, of, of legal and regulatory mechanisms. But to be honest, on balance, it, it hasn't really had that much of an effect so far. So perhaps... The introduction of a technology like this might force uh, citizens in some countries at least to think about, well, how ex what are the boundaries here? How far do we go? Uh, who benefits from this? Uh, who has it available to them? And how do we ensure that it doesn't have negative impacts on our societies? Let me ask you this about trust. I'll ask all of you, but David, as we were just speaking, would you trust Elon Musk with your brain? Would you try this out? <laughs> Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> I not, cer certainly would not trust him alone, uh, but I would say that I suppose about any medical procedure. I think we all check with a couple people ahead of time. I, I would want to know a lot more uh, before I would be willing to have something uh, this invasive uh, in my brain. Danny, coming to you, I know I've already asked you about whether there'd be queues around the block. Would you be in that queue? No, I'd be very, very, very far from that queue. OK, this is very telling. Let's ask the neuroscientist, shall we, at the University of Sussex, Professor Anil Seth. Would you be at all interested either in Musk's chip or any kind of chip? 
I'll give you the, the scientist's answer is it depends. I'm certainly not going to be in the queue for Musk's device as it is. Of course, we've already given our brains to Musk somehow. Those of us who still use X or Twitter were already being manipulated by Musk in that indirect way. But no, if I needed a brain implant for clinical reasons, for, because of paralysis or, or another treatable disease, then maybe. But for enhancing my cognitive capabilities, most definitely not. Uh, on, on the ethics point, I just want to ask you a bit more, Professor Anilseth, about the ethics of how you develop this technology and who's involved in it. Um, and I'll come back to you, David, on this as well from the oligarch point of view. But what do you think about having somebody like Musk rather than, say, I mean, a scientist, scientists are involved in it. It's not him personally doing the surgery and putting chips in people's brain. He's not personally doing it. He's just overseeing it as the boss. Uh, but do you think there are ethical concerns as having somebody like Musk operating in this arena? Well, it's fortunately, again, this kind of arena does have quite tight regulation. So that's I think that keeps the the strategy of Musk to move very, very quickly under control. We talked earlier that he did get into a little bit of hot water for the treatment of animals in an earlier stage of research. And the rest of it seems to be a, a bit above board. So I think, yeah, as as was pointed out earlier in our conversation, Musk does bring a lot of attention to this developing area and that can be good he's also you know, a very accomplished engineer and there are things about the approach that Neuralink is taking that are different from other companies and that may eventually benefit the field as a whole but yeah I think if, the, if it was dominated by Neuralink then I'd be worried but the fact that Neuralink is one among several companies and these other companies, in fact, have already achieved more. I mean, they haven't just put, we haven't heard anything at all about what happens. Like all that's been announced today is that the implant was successfully implanted. There's nothing about what this will enable the patient to do. There's no results. There's no, there's very little to go on. There's much more already happened. And the fact that this technology is being advanced in other ways by other companies that are all very closely regulated that gives me some reassurance. David, just uh, picking up on that thought of the ethics of those developed in this kind of technology, you talked about regulating um, oligarchy. If there was a way of doing that, in that form of hypothetical regulation, would you basically prevent oligarchs from getting involved in uh, anything that was to do with our bodies, anything medical? Um, I don't think I'm quite ready to recommend that, Roseanne. I think that, that one of the challenges we have as citizens of our societies is to ask the basic question, are our regulatory bodies actually doing what they're supposed to be doing in the first place? I mean, we, we've seen recently with Boeing and the 737 MAX that there's real issues about whether a long-established regulatory body is actually doing what it should be doing. So I think there's like a basic question here about governmental capability to, to, to regulate and control uh, oligarchs who are, of course, very powerful, very wealthy people who have exerted an awful lot of influence on our society. So I, I think we need to have a broad conversation about do we have the capabilities to do this? Uh, and then where, what direction do we want to move in? Um, per se, does an oligarch get forbidden from doing certain things? I don't think I'm quite ready to go there yet. Fair enough, but I think the 737 uh, max comparison there, that is a real failing of human and technical error uh, and worth uh, pointing out. It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, David Lingleback, Professor Anil Seth and Danny Fortson, thank you all so much for your time.